Hi, Chong Hing. Thank you so much for joining me today on this podcast. Yeah, thank you for having me, Lin. You're welcome. So I was going through your uh, story and I love how you've done so very, very much. And as I understand it, you, it all started for you in Penang, where you grew up in Georgetown, along this road called Victoria Street, known as Haki Sing Lo. And I would love to know, you know, in the 1960s, what was it like in that area? Because I understand it was like a Chinese traders neighborhood. So what was it like back then? Okay, just some context. Haiti um, Sinlo, um, Victoria Street, uh, is actually parallel to Wellesley. So, I mean, it's, it's like one street away from the, the main shipping uh, where, where all the goods arrive. You know, that my great grandparents were in, and my grandparents were in the business of trading. So, there's rice, I mean, there was rice milling, there's uh, coconut plantations and things like that. And so, they had to send things, I guess, uh, to and from places. And so they, they kind of like stationed themselves at high speed signal. So um, where I grew up, actually, the house is like an ancestral home. There are two units joined together. It's kind of like a cafe China house, you know, in Penang. It's like street to street. It's really long. And, but unlike China house, it, we had two units joined together. So it's broader, but, uh, but long. And... Um, I mean, to be honest, when you grow up, you only know your, your world is only that big. You know, I didn't know any differently. So, I mean, I wasn't very adventurous as a kid. As a kid, it's pretty much home and school, home and school, home and school. And weekends, my dad would take me to a movie. You know, so that, for me then, that was the world. You know, yeah. I didn't know about UK. I didn't know about... America or anything, you know, I didn't even know about the other side of the island, you know, I didn't even know about the beaches and all that until my teenage years when going to school, then there's all these school outings and things like that. So, well, long story short, I was pretty happy, you know, in, 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 that, in that world, you know, and I didn't expect anything else. <laughs> I didn't and I think expect, no, I didn't expect anything, you know. Yeah. And I think you were like the youngest of six siblings, right? And there's like an eight year gap yeah. between you and the next one. Everyone else is one, two years. So you're a bit of a, like an unexpected like child coming. Yeah. And your dad doted on you, unlike all your other yeah. siblings? Yes, I'm hammering. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can. It's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, my, my brothers and sisters have always taken pains to tell me how how lucky or privileged I am because I, I don't know. I mean, I, to be honest, I was the only child born after my father went bankrupt. So, I mean, so I was born into poverty, like, you know. So, I guess maybe that kind of changed him as a person or something, or he had more time on his hands than he could, like, um, look after me or pamper me a bit, you know. So, I mean, they also tell me I'm the only child that my dad never hit. You know, I mean, as in discipline, you know, in the good old days, I mean, nobody thinks twice about whacking their kid. Yeah. <laughs> their kid gets all You're alive. not even <laughs> whacked. Yeah, it just comes with the turf, you know. You do that, you get whacked. <laughs> so, um, yeah, in that, in that sense, I was very privileged. And and I also, because maybe, like, like I said, because he was bankrupt and he's like kind of a different person or at a different place in his life, he used to take me to cinema every Sunday. Every Sunday, we will, we will go and see a movie or two. Sometimes we see the morning show and then we see one afternoon show to follow up. And that is my biggest memory of growing up, you know, um, taking the bus with him and, you know, going to the, to the different cinemas and watching Chinese films and English films. And we sometimes even watch Tamil films. Oh, even. were there yeah. subtitles as well for you to follow? When, when you're young, you just look at the thing and sometimes you just cry and sometimes you just laugh. <laughs> you know, I, I remember the, the two um, Hindi films very clearly. One was uh, Bobby, the very famous one, and one was Hachi Mera Tachi, which is Elephant My Friend. Elephant My Friend. Yeah. What, was so it? Was like, what was it huh? that, you know, left such a big impression on you? <laughs> I don't know, I just cried a lot. <laughs> I feel very sad. <laughs> I, I still have 
this ability to be really affected by by film. I mean, although I'm in the business of creating like this parallel or fake reality, you know what I mean? That, but um, somehow I managed to sell myself <laughs> that, 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 that experience even now, you know? I watch it and I get quite affected and I get, you know, I get moved and, and taken places with it. And I wonder like, it because... It holds some magic for me, yeah. Yeah. It still and, holds some magic for me. And I wonder, you mentioned poverty earlier because as I understand, both your mom and your dad, they were matchmates. They never met each other until they were married. And both of them came from like quite yeah. well-off families before they got married, right? And to this bankruptcy. So did you ever feel that tension between them? That was it something that came up a lot as a child? Mm, I think they were quite good at hiding uh, most of it. I mean, of course, sometimes you sense something is wrong, but you don't really know. You know? And also, as a child, you, you don't have concept of rich or poor. You know, you just like, okay, this is what I'm having for dinner. You just expect every, every, every schoolmate in is at home will be having about the same meal. You don't know. You have no no comparison. You know. Yeah. So I mean, you know, what I mean, what I've kind of uh, found out since was that a lot of it had to do with my dad's pride. You know, because my mom's family still had a bit of money, but he didn't want any help from them. You know, so so that was kind of like a source of tension. I mean, but to my mom's credit, I mean, she kind of like stood by his pride. You know. Through yeah. all this, when you, she could have easily, in in modern circumstances, she wouldn't have her stay, you know. But in those days, I guess the the belief system it was different, you know. So you you stand by through thick and thin sort of thing. Yeah, and your mom was a homemaker, right? So was she like one of the most prominent figures in your life when you were a child? What was she like? She was. She was, and what was pretty amazing about her is that. I guess you can see the effort to be not cheerful but to be buoyant. You know, like not to not to take get it get her down and she kind of she had she did all sorts of things. I mean when looking for money she would like sometimes cook um fried do fried noodles and sell outside the house, you know. I mean at that time you go like why is she selling fried noodles? You know what I mean? But of course, because she needed the money. You know, but when you were a child, you go like, and then, yeah, I mean, we even used to, I mean, when times were really bad, I remember we used to sell uh, clothes as bundles. You know what I mean? Not like, like, so you go to a shop and you they weigh how many kgs that is, and then they, or how many pounds that is, and then they pay you for it, you know? So she kind of tried her best, I guess did everything she could to, to, to make it, to see us through, like, let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. And you guys had fun as well. There was like one scene, I remember in the movie you made later of your life, where the mom is dancing with Sunny a lot. So was that something <laughs> that you did as a child? Yeah, for- yeah actually, I mean, that is, I'm glad you brought that up because that point in the movie is really important to me because the whole movie before that is all misery, woe is me, woe is me, you know? Uh, I mean, but... I, I wanted at the end to have the joyful thing because I wanted to acknowledge that it is how we remember things. It's how we choose to remember things. So if you want to dwell on the bad, of course, there'll be some shit. But if you, if you want to dwell on the good as well, there's also good stuff. Like we, we went picnicking once, you know, and then uh, and we, I mean, our dancing. That, I mean, those are really, really great moments that that kind of like if you don't don't uh, bring it back at the at the end of the film, it would be so unfair to everyone. It's as though it's one whole miserable um, mini series. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I, I wanted to, for those who are listening who don't understand your backstory, to contrast that with you explaining why it was that this dancing and this joy was so significant for you. Because you had a bit of a contentious relationship with your mom as well, right? Because of your siblings. Could you share a bit yeah. of that? No, I mean, actually, so it was only how many years ago? The film uh, was 201. 2017, 2017, 2010, 
I think, or, or you started it, it, shooting in 2016. Really? 12, yeah, 12 years ago, maybe only in my mid 40s or late 40s did I understand the what my mother was trying to do. I mean, as a as a child, there's always resentment, and I mean, in the family of six, it's always a little bit competitive, you know. And since I have my father's full attention and love, I thought, why can't I get my mother? <laughs> <laughs> You're the golden boy. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, my silly little head, this is what the, the thing you, you think. And like, why is she so hard on me? And why is she so nice to my other brother? And difficult. Let's put it that way, you know? So, I never could get my head around it until a conversation I had with my sister. And she kind of, Said that well, he needs help more. He needs more help, you know. So I mean, my my brother was, what's the word, mentally challenged a little bit, you know. So um, I just resented it. The 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 circumstances that that created, without trying to understand how difficult it must be for him as well, yeah. you know. And I also I didn't try to understand why my mother would devote so much of her time to him. To looking after him, you know. I think so, we can... I mean, because all parents will help the weakest one. Yeah, I remember there was a the line okay. saying, a, a line in the movie, I think, saying that you know, if no one loves him, then who will? Right, which is very uh, yeah, I'm his mom. If I don't love him, who will? Yeah. Yeah. And also the tagline of the film is pretty, pretty telling in that it says, "The hardest people to love are the one who need it the most." Yeah. 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 So I guess she was trying to balance out everything, you know? Yeah. yeah. And the challenges only came out when your brother was like 20 plus years old, right? So it wasn't an issue yeah. earlier. I think there, there is something that it was not said, not felt out in the movie. There's a history of family uh, uh, mental illness in my mother's, on my mother's side. My mother's family. Because one of my uncles is also a little bit touched and, 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 and so on and so on. So I guess there's also living with that, knowing that perhaps it, as a mother, knowing that perhaps it came from you, you know, so I mean, I guess she has a, she felt even more a stronger compulsion to help the afflicted son, you know, yeah. Yeah, to the point where like, you, I think your family was trying to put him in like an institution to help him, right? And she resisted, saying, no, I want to look after him. Yeah, her. actually, she, there was one thing she would not even um, talk about. I mean, because the, the presence of somebody like that, regardless of uh, the reason, is very disruptive for the rest of the family. So, I mean, naturally, the rest of the family, and who, whoever's lives are disrupted, always feel a resentment, you know, uh, rightly or wrongly. I'm not saying it's the right way to go, but you do feel a resentment. Like, why, why is it affecting me so badly all the time, you know? And there's a, a, almost a palpable tension every time he's around, you know. And it's not something easy to live with, you know. In your own home and to be tense all the time is not easy. But um, regardless of the objections, she would not even consider it. Yeah. It was only until she died that, um, that um, we acted on it because nobody else could keep him in check. Or, or, or kind of be able to talk to him or reach out to him, you know. So um, it, it was unfortunate, but um, necessary. You know? And I wonder with all this that was going home at your in, at home, how did it affect you, for instance, in school? Were you like an outgoing person or were you more withdrawn? I was actually, you know, it was really weird. I remember myself as being a quiet kid. <laughs> <laughs> and then a friend of mine went to see the film and said, you were never quiet, you were oh. a <laughs> Like, it can't be right. <laughs> but you see, you see what I mean? The duality and uh, different perspectives. I do, I mean, I remember myself as quite withdrawn and not that outgoing. But clearly, I'm, I've been reminded I'm not. <laughs> what were the most important friendships, if you were, that were from in school? I met a friend, uh, I made a friend in school from like standard two, eight years old. We were like in the same class all the way until I think form five. I think we dropped out of school in form four. Yeah. 
So, and then, I mean, we, we went separate ways. We left school to go and study, um, study cooking, I think hotel management. Wow. Hotel management. Yeah, and then uh, um, we kept in touch all through the years and it's strange. I mean, this this bond, this friendship that we formed when we were young, even when as adults, as young adults, we, we had a huge gap where we didn't see each other, only kept in touch a little bit via letters. Um, we still kind of like click the same way as when we when we were first when we were kids, you know. So that was that's really important. And also, what was really important about that friendship for me uh, is that this is one person. He was also a good student in school. He dropped out not because he was a bad student, you know, but he knew at a very early age what he wanted. Wow. Yeah, I mean. From four, from three, from four, how old were we? From three, 13. 15. 17, 18 years old. And to 17, 18 years old, I just wanted to go and dance or, or listen to music or hang out with friends. You know what I mean? And there's this guy who already knew what he wanted. And he, he acted on it. At the time when he left school, I can still remember the reaction. Everybody thought, wow, that's a bad idea. Yeah, you don't even have um, MCE. Or did he get his MCE? I don't think he did. He went. He went. He went to shoot. He, he so went. MCE is the so, STPM of the time, is it? Yes, MCE is the uh, Malaysian Certificate of Education. Yeah, SPM of that time. SPM. Okay. SPM. Wow. So I mean, it was quite grave. Well, our parents keep telling us you better study something so you get a degree to fall back on and all that. But it's like the guy that actually jump off the plane without a parachute, you know. Yeah. I mean, he is now very successful as his own chain of restaurants in Penang. In fact, in the filming of the uh, movie, um, in the movie, there's a best friend who is Bob, right? The Bob character. Yeah. We shot that in his, my friend's actual house. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's kind of meta, but uh, I mean, like, yeah. yeah. I asked him, hey, can you shoot in the Okay. <laughs> Just like that, right? <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. And I think you also had this friendship with the orientation queen who's Yeah. Yeah. We're still very good friends actually. Um yeah. I mean it was one of those strange fits because she was like the popular girl and everybody was just like and I was the nerd, the studious um, nerd and somehow she just saw something in me or something and we just clicked and we became friends, you know, she kind of, actually, she was a formative for me. In what sense? Because then, at that time, I was like, I had all these like Coca-Cola bottle glasses, <laughs> you know, spectacles, like really thick uh, lenses and everything. She kind of made me uh, go and work uh, part-time to save up enough money to go and make contact lenses. And she kind of taught me how to because my mother used to buy my shirts and pants <laughs> until I was quite old. <laughs> so she told me, you better change your dressing. <laughs> Gave you a fas fashion makeover. <laughs> yeah, kind of, I mean, I'm not by, by no stretch a fashion plate, but to be at least dressed more my, my, my age, you know? Yeah, so. <laughs> Kind of wearing what my mother was doing for me and we're kind of like a little bit like yeah, proper, you know. And you guys were going like disco dancing together as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she used to ride a motorbike and I don't have a motorbike or, or anything. So she was she badass. Come, yeah, she'd come to my house and pick me up and then take me to go dancing. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my mom said, Who's that? <laughs> like the girl comes in the motorbike to pick you up. <laughs> That's so funny. And she was also... I mean, go on. No, we are still good friends. And I'm, I'm actually godfather to her son. I mean, she's wow. married and living abroad. Yeah. yeah. We're still great friends. Yeah. Wonderful. And I think she's the, also the reason you went to Singapore, right? In 1932. How did that happen? Yeah. Basically, because the family couldn't afford it. You know what I mean? So, so she kind of like, kind of prodded me along they are because the, the uncles and all that they were well off it's only my father that went bankrupt you know so uh, she said why don't you just ask them and just 
so little money, I mean, you know, for schooling, it's not like, you know, so I kind of went to ask and then she made me apply for, for the scholarship. And um, yeah, and I, with some help, I got, I got scholarship and I, I could afford to go. And Singapore kind of like opened my eyes to, to a, a, a different world, a real world, if you like, you know. In what sense? Because this is your first well, time leaving time, family, right? Yeah, correct. For the first time, I was living away from home and you just take so much for granted, you know. Toilet paper, la, tissue, la, like towels, la, your laundry, you have to do yourself. La. I mean, things you don't even think about. Oh, I don't have a mirror. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you just think you will be there. <laughs> yeah, correct. And so, so you try to, you learn to fend for yourself, la. you learn to be independent, you know. And I mean, because I was quite tempted by my dad at home and also to some degree my mom, my mom this, it was a, initially a shock, but very thrilling at the same time. Because you're not answerable to anyone, you just can, you can stay up late, you can do anything you want, and nobody is there to like reprimand you. So, so that was, there was growth, so to speak, you know. And so you were at National University of Singapore doing double physics and math. And what do you remember <laughs> of that course? Were you going to school all the time? Like, what were you as a student? To be honest, I remember it quite clearly in the sense that um, I kind of went mad. I went a bit wild because first time away from home and everything is so fun and shiny and new and, and all that. So I kind of completely immersed myself in a good time, you know? So I was just out and hanging with friends and dancing and things like that, going dancing, going out and drinking and, and things like that. And then I only attended the minimum amount of uh, tutorials and what they call workshops to, so that you can sit for your exam. Because if you don't, if you don't um, meet the minimum criteria, you, you're not allowed to sit for the exam. So, I mean, unbeknownst to my parents, I mean, I was just um, not applying myself the way they would have liked me to, you know. But um, it, it, was so, it came to a point that when I attended a lecture, that some of my fellow uh, classmates thought I was a super senior. I mean, you have seniors that uh, graduated and then they come back to observe to, so that they can be teaching assistants or, 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 you know, so because they have never seen me. Oh, no. <laughs> um, and also, I, in Singapore, I stayed in a hostel, on, on campus hostel. And I have learned by, from some friends since that I'm, um, I, I'm taught as a lesson to the new the freshmen. So, I mean, eventually in National University of Singapore, I failed. I, my first year, first year repeat, second year, second year repeat, and I failed my second year repeat, and so I had to leave. So I was used as a lesson. I mean, the, during orientation, the seniors would tell them, don't be like Sao Tiong Hin. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Messed up and got thrown out. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so did you tell your parents that you got thrown out? uni because you were the well, I mean, first in the family to have gone to uni as well right i had to tell them of course uh, you know but that's why i, I didn't go back to Penang. i mean, um i when, when i told them they were so nice about it they just made me feel worse you know they just say oh you tried your best just come home i didn't try my best <laughs> so <laughs> so i really couldn't face them so i just i did the cowardly thing and i came to pay out even though I didn't know, at that point, I didn't know anyone in KL. It didn't cross your mind to like maybe stay on in Singapore and try to find something there? I couldn't. Yeah, you're not allowed to. And also at that time when, uh, when 80, it was 86, I came home, there was also a recession mm. in Singapore as well. I mean, regionally. Like, but uh, So at that point, I remember people who graduated who couldn't find work are allowed to break their scholarship, break their bond and come back. You know, yeah. So, I mean, having failed, there was nothing holding me back, you know, and you're not allowed to stay on. Because Singapore has this very interesting social programming that 
if you are a graduate from our university, we would like you to live here. But if you are not, maybe not. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> so you came so, to KL in 1986. Was that your first time in the city? Like, how did you find yeah. your accommodation? Like, what was it like in the first few weeks? I kind of got one or two contacts from some hostel mates in Singapore who came from KL. So, and then I got hold of uh, some Penang uh, schoolmates um, who moved to KL to work, you know. So um, I called them up and said, hey, I'm here. I need a place to stay. <laughs> Can I stay with you? That's how I think. So I kind of did couch surfing. You know, like I would stay like two nights at one person's house and then another two nights at another person's and then kind of move around, you know. I mean, when you are young, you don't think anything about this. You know? just, okay, what, what is my situation? What do I need? Okay, I'm going to do this. <laughs> you just like problem solution, problem solution. You, know? you don't like, there's no long-term planning. And more importantly, there's no, no embarrassment. You know? Yeah. If they don't want to help, they'll say no. Lah. Then, okay, lah. then you look for somebody who will help. You know? So and what was the... Kind of what was the plan in terms of like jobs though? How were you supporting yourself? I don't know. I mean, I was getting quite desperate because um, I came with, I think I had only about like 10 ringgit or something like that in my pocket. So means there was about five things at that time, you know. In my, yeah. So, But also one of the people I met in Singapore gave me a contact for a, a lady in a, in a production company. In a film production hub. I didn't really know what that meant because I mean film production is so far away from your, your rea reality that you never think about it, you know. So I mean, like I said, very soon, pretty soon. I mean, my friends helped me by feeding me. You know? <laughs> so, but but I mean ten bucks don't go very far even in those days, you know. So I called up this the contact that I was given and this lady, the late uh GD lovely lovely lady and she asked me to go in to see her i went to see her she didn't have anything but she thought i was interesting uh, enough to put in in a tv commercial so she said would you do a tv commercial i said sure how much she said 800 bucks say, okay it's <laughs> good <laughs> yeah i mean i mean for somebody with less than 10 bucks in his pocket 800 is a lot a lot of money you know a, a, so I did the TV commercial. What were and you supposed I, to be doing? Were you like modeling? No, no. actually uh, it was uh, for Shell Moto Oil. Moto, uh, the motorbike oil. I was supposed to be a biker. So I was kind of wearing a lead, uh, leather biking outfit and helmet. And only at the end I took off the helmet. <laughs> so I mean, you wear the helmet so that the sun people can do all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah. So you know. enjoyed it? You enjoyed it and decided to do more of this? I enjoyed it and I thought, I mean, honestly, I was shit. I was, I was bad because I was so nervous that, you know, I mean, the, the director kept telling me, you have to calm down, you have to calm down. I said, okay, you <laughs> okay. But, you know, like, you didn't know what to do and you feel so awkward being the, being the focus of attention, you know, like, everything is just done around you, you know. So that was new to me. But I, I, I thought the process was interesting intriguing because it's everything I, I don't know and so I decided maybe I should go into advertising or film production so I looked in the yellow pages I came across advertising as one of the first things actually I was looking for film production but I, I saw advertising first so I called the agencies up one by one and nobody would see me hmm. yeah was it because yeah. you didn't I mean, have the experience like it's like no, they just, I mean, I was cold calling, to be honest. I mean, they don't know me from Adam. So I just cold call and say, hey, I'm looking for a job. You know, is there anything I can do that job? And they say no, and that's it, you know. I mean, cold calling even now is not, it's frowned upon, you know, like, like nobody like, anyway. So, but I called, got to Ogilvy and Mater, oh. And Ogilvy and Major, I asked for the uh, producer and I was put in touch with Farida Marikan. 
she is the grand dam of advertising and she was also a news leader at that time, which I didn't know at the point. And she was the head of AV, uh, audiovisual and photography. And she asked me to go in and I went in and she said, okay, I like you, but I don't have a job. But uh, I know somebody who does, who is looking for someone, you know. So she put me in touch with Joe Hashem, who is now her husband. Yeah. So I went to see Joe. <laughs> and I can still remember very clearly because sometimes they remind me about it. So at the interview, I was asked, why should I hire you? You know, and I said, because I'm good. <laughs> and I got the job. <laughs> it, yeah, it turned out that I was quite natural at it. I mean, I was a production assistant and production assistant, you do everything. And so you were like... Mm -hmm. um, gopher lah, the gopher. Make coffee, you sweep the floor, you carry the lights, you go and source the cell, do the casting, source the location. Because last time there's no, it's not specialized like now. When you watch a movie, a TV commercial production, and there's a casting department, there's a location, there's a wardrobe and makeup and all. Last time it's one person do everything. So I was lucky to come into the business at that point. Because by going through all the departments, you learn everything, you know. You learn how the camera works, you learn how long it takes to turn things around, you know. You, you learn how to go. I remember like casting on the street. You go out to, on the street and you look out for nice looking people and say, hey, would you want to be a, a movie actor? star? <laughs> talent, you know, like you'd be surprised how many people say yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that must have been yeah. fun going up and asking people, do you want to be a talent? Looking back, it is really fun. I mean, all of the whole thing was really, really good because it was a complete learning experience. And I, I, I remember having to, to take three, three, three modes of transport to get to work. Wow. So, yeah, because I was crashing with a friend in uh, Taman Mayan in Kinche, and the office was right in, right in town, uh, near, near the general hospital. So, so it was like, Two changes of bus, you know, and one right, one right from the house to the first bus stop, and then two changes of bus to get to work. You, and you don't think about it when you are young. It's like, okay, this is what I have to do to get there. I'll do it. That means I got to wake up at six. Okay, <laughs> and then when you finish work, you go back the same way. You know, it's like, yeah, it was really, really interesting for me. Yeah, and then uh, very quickly. Um, Joe was very kind to me and very quickly he promoted me. Like, so Within three months, three right? Months, yeah. Yeah, in three months I became a producer. Like I started a production assistant and I became a uh, producer. I did my, I so my what's the difference? Producer. What's the difference between like uh, assistant because and assistant? As a production assistant, you used to wait for the cue from the producer. The producer say, go and look for a location for this. And you go and go and find wardrobe for this story, and then you run around and you go and sort it out. But as the producer, you are the one who set the direction. You become responsible for the whole thing. But I mean, I was producer in name, but I, I was still doing the work myself. So because the company got very busy, so the producer I was working under, I stepped um, away from her, and I operated on my own um, project. You know. For, for the director. So, so I, I, and part of the beauty was that because I didn't know the rules, I went into it blind. You know, I mean, I didn't know that there's a way of doing this and all that. So I went to like Manlung and all that. Manlung was a very famous department of store in those days, you know, store in those days. So I went there and said, I want to go to a TV commercial. And they said, okay. And then, um, then I'll arrange their conference room and I'll uh, have the uh, um, director come to the conference room and review the clothes there. And in those days, it's unheard of. Yeah, you usually go and buy things and then take it home back to the office and show, you know what I mean? So, I, because you don't know the rules, you, you are seen and you just do things that you feel is right and, and Inevitably, you become an innovator, right? you know. Like, but it's it's only because I didn't know the rules. 
Mm. It's wonderful that Joe gave you that freedom to just do it in your own way. Yeah, yeah, correct. So, I mean, I was very lucky because in those days, nothing is so structured. No, I mean, everything is kind of free and easier. And um, so you just did it. And I used to kind of like almost live in the office. You know? and I didn't resent it at all. I was just so happy there's something to do and get, get some money every month, you know? Yeah. So what about that process? You were a producer and then you end up setting up your own production house, right? Which has offices like Malaysia, okay. Singapore, Indonesia. Like, How did that there is, happen? There is a gap there. Uh, mm. I was a producer then. Uh, I mean, when with uh, Joe's com- Joe Hashem's company, I did quite a lot of big commercials, TV commercials and all that. And, and very, I think I was there for like two years, two years or two and a half years, three years. And, and very soon, um, the, the kind of industry kind of like know about you, about me. Lah, you know? So I was offered a job with an advertising agency. And I decided to take it up as a challenge. And I was handling uh, Salem. I was handling Salem and Metro Jaya. Two very Huge. prestigious towns at that time. And also, Secret Advertising was the biggest revenue for advertising in those days. So it was a huge responsibility. And so it was very exciting. Um, and then I was offered by another, coached by another advertising agency. And I quickly jump on the little money I was offered. And, and, and then at the second agency, I mean, I, 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 did, I, read, I did some things in Tokyo and all that and all that, but I decided that maybe um, advertising is not for me. I was beginning to think that I, I miss production, you know, sort of. Mm-hmm. And then I was offered a job in post-production. Post production, the a post house is the one where they do the editing, the color grading, the special effects, and all that. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. I don't know anything about post production, you know. So I joined them, and I went down to Singapore. Uh, I was posted there for three months I think, for training. It was an Australian company based in Singapore. So I trained, and then I came back to Malaysia and I set up the thing for them. It's really funny. I was all um, how old was I? 28, I think. And I set up a company and I got I got tax rebate from Maida and everything. So they were saying, huh, you got all this? I said, yeah, we need one, right? <laughs> we need tax rebate because you're bringing things from Australia. <laughs> so so it, it, it was really, really fun for me. It was a great learning experience. And then... I think then it was one something... Of my colleagues Sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, you were saying? Uh, one of my colleagues in post-production actually uh, wanted to be a director, film director. And um, he knew that I was... I, also in the post-production company, I was a producer as well. A manager and producer and everything I set it up. And oh, I, there's another bit to the post-production story. I was so young, right? I set up the company, right? So I was interviewing, interviewing staff, right? Because we haven't got the building, the building uh, is being renovated and all that. You know? So I will call, the, I will advertise and these people will call, uh, apply for the job. And I'll meet them at a Pizza Hut or at a coffee shop. <laughs> and they look at me and they say, they, I didn't know this. I mean, years later, they, they told me, um, they said, they conferred with each other. Hey, this guy for real or not? <laughs> I'm, all, I'm almost their age and I'm like a fly by night and meeting them at a coffee shop. <laughs> I don't even have a real office. <laughs> but they gave you a chance. <laughs> ah, I said, well, they're so like that because they're young. They you say, no, no, last we try not to try. So they, I mean, they all came together and we have kind of stayed like in touch through the years, you know. Mm. Okay, so going back to my colleague, uh, he's Australian. And he wanted to be a film director and he said, why don't we set out our own company? And I thought, yeah, actually, why don't we? And then we set out our own company and then um, we had a lot of success with it. So very quickly, we expanded and everything. And it came to a point when I got bored. I mean, three years into it, I think, three years into it, yeah, I got bored and uh, I said I wanted to give up the business, you know. 
And because you've been doing this for like 13 years by now, right? So it's been quite long. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, correct. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And so, he said to me, why don't you direct? He said, you love telling me what to do. <laughs> why don't you direct? Me? Okay, I'll try it. <laughs> so I started calling people because um, I thought music videos would be interesting to do. So I called up CMI. I didn't know anyone there. I called them up and said, hey, I'm a film director. I'm looking. Uh, I want to do a music video. Do you have anything I can do? <laughs> and then they said, actually, we do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Can you come in and see us? So I went in to see them and uh, then they gave me the two projects, KRU uh Fanatic. Fanatic. KRU Gataran Jiwa, you know? And and they gave me the budget. I mean the budget was I mean I dare to say it was fifty thousand and uh, by advertising standards fifty thousand is nothing. In those days advertising mm-hmm. budgets were close to a million, a few hundred thousand wow. minimum. Yeah, okay. Minimum. So I thought, oh, that's very little, but I didn't say anything. I said, okay. Then I, because I'm in the business and I'm my own company, I have all these uh, suppliers you can lean on to, to help you, you know? So I called everybody and everybody agreed to help me and we, we made a music video and Terry Fanatic kind of launched me because I won like every award in Malaysia and it was also sent by MTV uh, to represent um, Malaysia in New York. TV in New York. So, and do you get to go to New York? Or you didn't? No, I didn't. Yeah. Little did I know that 50,000 was actually a lot of money because in music videos in those days, we used to do things for 1,000, 2,000. Oh, <laughs> how can you do anything with that? That's why you have them walking in the park and you have like them walking by the beach all the time. You know what I mean? <laughs> No, 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 nothing against the other directors who did that. But I mean, circumstances were such that they, you know, they had no only choice. so much to work with. So they did what they had, to, what they could, you know. Mm. So, I mean, I, what I'm trying to say here is that I was lucky without even knowing it to get such a huge budget, you know. And I thought, oh, this is so little. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, yeah, then I went on to direct a lot of music videos and I thought, I cannot keep asking my uh, my friends, uh, my suppliers, and also my friends as well, to do me favors. So I said, okay, I'm going to stop doing music videos. You know? Then I, I stopped. I did quite a lot of major ones. Uh, uh, then I, I decided to stop. And I was doing TV commercials at the same time. So, and then... Um, I you split with again. my business partner. Like, oh, you split with your bus. Okay. I split with my business partner and I, I joined another company uh, to direct TV commercials as well. And I got bored. Actually, the boredom is kind of to do with what I was doing or maybe to do with myself. I don't know, you know. So, I decided, I've always wanted to make a movie. But because I, you're kept quite busy by the TV commercials, so every month you're shooting like maybe two, three TV commercials at a time. So you, you have very little time to think or to, to just stop and work on the script or something. So I decided I'm to give myself the time. So I stopped and I think I stopped in year 2000. Year 2000, I stopped TV commercials completely and I wanted to devote myself to film. Uh, and seeing the success I had earlier on calling the... Uh, advertising agencies and then getting getting a job and then calling the recording company and getting a, a job and all that. So I kind of did the same. <laughs> I called up all the movie production houses and nobody would see me <laughs> this time. <laughs> yeah, except for two two people, Hafsham, Osman Hafsham and Irma Fatima. They are the two who agreed to see me. But um, they were very nice, very nice to me, and but there was very little they could do to help me. I mean, they could have help projects. me, like, yeah, because it's a different universe. Because of my all the experience I had in the short form, I thought that it would be an easy leap into the long form. But little did I realize it's a completely different universe, you know. 
So I tried and I tried and I tried and I got nowhere. And so then my mother passed away and then obviously my money is depleting, you know, like I've not worked for like three years. But I had enough money to see me through to a certain point. And then I decided, okay, I have to stop. I have to go back into TV commercials because some people, some of the people who knew me in the TV commercial world, kind of offered to set up company or uh, businesses with me. You know, they say, hey, come back lah, come and set. We do this together and all that. Then I, I decided, okay lah, I got really like getting a bit scary, my, my situation, so I might go back. So that night I went to sleep. As I slept, late in the night, late in the night, my phone rang. It's a friend of a uh, film producer friend of mine in Hong Kong. He's the producer, Daniel Yu, he's a producer for Andy Lau at that point. And he said, Oh, Andy agreed to invest in your film. So I said, Okay. And then I hung up and I went back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> the next day I woke up. I thought, did I dream this or did I dream this? <laughs> you know? so I called him, I called him and said, Hey, did you call me last night? <laughs> <laughs> is it? Yeah, I did. I called you and I told you the good news, and you just like not inter- not very excited. <laughs> <and> just hung <laughs> up. I said I was asleep, like, That's why, you know. So while I was at the point when I wanted to go back into advertising, I got the call that brought me back from the brink. You know, so I decided. So we explored working together. Eventually, it didn't work out. The, the, the Hong Kong thing didn't work out, but it delivered me away from going back to advertising. So I went on, went on, went on. It kept me going for an, another while. Then again, I felt, I think it kept me going for another nine months or so, or mm. a year or so. Then I felt, I cannot, I really cannot continue already because it gets me, my, my resources are depleting like crazy, you know? Then I called Hush Chum, who, who, who actually helped me formulate some proposals and things like that, you know. So I, I, I remember it was Raya, uh, it was uh, Puasa Man. So I called him and said, hey, can I book a Puasa with you? He said, oh, okay, can. So then uh, <laughs> I, called, I went to meet him in town. It was at the Nathan's Hotel, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so I went to meet him in town, and as, as I was on the way to town, I got a call. I got a call from Tiara. Tiara called me and said, Hey, what are you doing? I said, I'm on the way to for dinner. Because I was in a bad mood already, right? I, I mean, kind of like felt down and sorry for myself. <laughs> you know? so, so, and she said, Hey, no, 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 cancel your dinner, come have dinner with me. I said, No, la, no, la, cannot. La. You know? But she was quite persistent. So I, I said to her, Okay, after dinner, I call you. Maybe after dinner, we meet. You know? So I went down, met Hapsham, and then told him I'm going back to advertising. And then, you know, and thank you for, for helping me and all that, bought him dinner. Then I was driving back home. And the phone rang again. Of course, I didn't call Tiara like, because. <laughs> so I called, uh, my phone rang again. It was Tiara again. So I said, hey, hi, hi. Uh, where are you? I said, I'm at the traffic light just before my apartment. You know? So I said, we meet another time. Lah. Yeah. Then she said, oh, very good. I'm at the cafe next to your apartment. <laughs> <laughs> and you come and meet. Swing by. What to do? Uh? She was ready. Really have to go. Cafe, you know? <laughs> so I turned around. I went to the cafe to meet her. When I went, it was her, Mama Khalid, and Dominic P. I didn't know she wanted to be a movie. I really didn't know. I just know her as a friend from like, the party days when I was going out dancing and all that. And we used to bump with each other. So we sat down. I still didn't know. I mean, I was so distracted by my own misery at the point that I didn't think that who are these other two people, you know, like. <laughs> Then we were just having a drink and then she asked me, what do you think of Putri Dino Yoda? She thought, she asked me and I said, oh, I think it's a stupid story. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hold back. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just, then she said, why? Why do you say that? I said, because you never know why she turned down a king and you don't know what happened to her. 
you know what kind of story is that we don't know the ending so then she said oh i want to make a putri guno leda movie <laughs> <laughs> and then it's as it turns out Mama Khalid wrote the script and, and as it turns out Dominic Yee was the producer scheduled um, to produce the film then so she said anyway here's a copy of the script why don't you have a look at it and tell us what you think I thought oh well, you fuck you know, like, <laughs> I messed up big time but anyway it's truly what I believe it's truly what I believe at that time so I just said Stated it lah, you know. So I took the script back. I read it that night, and as I was reading it, it was written as an action thing. Oh. Action film, yeah. Mama did a great job with uh, kind of like modernizing it lah, making it. Although it was serious costume, uh, it was a lot of action and a lot of fighting and things like that. So as I read it, I felt that the Part of the story was somewhere else, you know. So that night itself, I think I finished reading about two something, and I was writing writing out my my thoughts, you know, as I, like you know. Your treatment I, of the script. Yeah, correct. I wrote until like about four something, two hours over. I remember, but and then when I finished writing and saying, okay, I. If, I, I see this way and that way and the other and all that. And was it completely said, different from what Muhammad came up with? I focused on the love story. I went to the love story. So I texted it to her and then I went to sleep. Next morning, quite early in the morning, I think nine something, I got a phone call from Dominic. He said, Hey, you text Tiara last night, you're to me. I said, Yes, I did. Then he said, very brave, huh? You, I said, yeah. I, that's how I felt. So I thought I took it down. You know, I I, I write it down. I said, you know, I'm sorry. I said, I said, oh, you're very lucky. She loves the treatment. I said, oh. I said, then you're on. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, I mean, in principle, I'm on now. And she stopped looking for a director because they were. Apparently, other directors they were they were gonna meet with, you know. So I got kind of got on board and then started developing it, uh, the script in the in the direction that I saw it, you know. How long was that whole development process to like beginning to film? Long. Yeah. Two years. Wow. About a year, a year plus, a year plus, because um, yeah, I mean. She was quite thorough as well. I mean, the production. We wanted to do research. We went to, we went to Georgia to stay at the actual palace. Met with the palace people to see what their daily routine is like. Because she wants to know how to act like a princess as well. Yeah, what their discipline is like. And mm. to us, they they lead empty lives. I mean, from the outside looking in, they every day they they wake up, they do prayers, they practice dance, they do. But actually, it's all a form of discipline for them. You know, it's like. To focus on, I guess, what they are meant to be, you know, to, to focus, to prepare them for their role, and and stay and stay focused on that, you know. So, a lot. I mean, so it took us a long time, and then. Were you doing uh, something on the side as you were developing this? No. How, how else were you supporting yourself then? Um, she was. Tara was very kind and fair. Tara and Dominic, they were very kind and fair. And they gave me a stipend, you know, like uh, a small retainer. Yeah, over the period. Yeah. Wow. So, so you basically owe your eggs in this one basket. Like you gave it your all. Only egg, only basket. <laughs> so like, I mean, yeah. Did you face any pushback? Because this is like a Malay film and you're like a Chinese and you've never directed a film before. I, I mean, I won't go into the details, but mm. there were some very clear, unhappy people. Yeah, who were displeased with the situation. I mean, like, I started uh, going out uh, to events with Tiara and uh, Dato. I mean, Tan Sri now. Yeah. And they introduced me to this very famous person, you know, and the famous person said to them, with me standing there, 
I said I reached out my hand to shake his hand and he didn't even take my hand and said he said point blank to, to Ciara and I thought you're making a huge mistake. Wow. Yeah. He said if if you give it to me, I'll make sure you have a great film. With 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 him, with me, you're making a huge mistake. So, wow. Do you feel I'm the pressure? Yeah. Huh? Well, do you feel I'm the pressure? Back, um, well, I I have quite a <clears throat> objective view about it. Because the thing is that this is shaping up to be the, the biggest film ever for Malaysia. You know, at that point. And that these are people who have been in the industry for a long time. And here is this unknown that this break. What I expect them to rejoice for me. You know what I mean? So I mean the reality is there there will be some different, you know. So I was not I was not blind to that. Yeah. yeah but it didn't yeah. It's, I wish it could have been nicer, more pleasant, but I'm also not totally surprised. Yeah, yeah. That's good. And you said it was shaping up to be the biggest, one of the biggest. So, like, was the budget a lot higher than normal? Like, what? Actually, what it just that? took on a life of its own. It just took on a life of its own. And then um, we got. Also, I'm the uh, first time director, I took, like, like, you are not aware of the protocol, you know, so you're not, you don't have any fear in you because you, you've never, I've never made a film before, so we'll climb a mountain and we'll shoot it on the mountain, okay? <laughs> okay. What could go <laughs> wrong? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sort of thing, we shoot as, there's a, a ship scene and we shoot it in the sea, okay? No, actually, honestly, a lot of my decisions are practical because we don't have a indoor pool or studio that can can create a sea or, or a ship. You know, uh, you don't have. And our set building skills are very limited because at that point, um, we have stopped making studio films for a long time. I mean, we shot in 2002. Um, the last studio film, like on the scale of a, a period film, was in the 60s, late 60s at the at the scene. So it's been many, many years since we did a historical set piece, you know. And you guys were building so, like palaces and harbors as well, right? Yeah, so, so it was very interesting. Uh. So I mean, but to the, honestly, to the producer's credit, they really wanted to do something that uh, that Malaysians can be proud of and that won't embarrass us at the International Film Festival, you know. The, the, it was very clear from the beginning that's what we wanted to achieve. So they, they also put their money where their mouth is. So I mean when things came like, okay, this, if we do this, it's going to cost this much. Yes, they would, they would do it. And so, as, so the budget grew, you know. I mean, to, I, I can still remember um, at the end of it when we were cutting the offline of the film, the, the offline of the film, so we showed showed it for we had an internal viewing, you know. And then uh, at that point we already decided that the music score is gonna be a synthesizer because we wanted to save money. We didn't do a, a, a symphonic score. And then at the end of the thing, um Sanjay said, How much would a symphonic score cost? He said about one point something million. Oh more. wow. And he said Let's do it. He loved it so much that he was willing to. Oh, okay. <laughs> Contrary to popular belief, it's not my fault that the budget went up. You know? <laughs> yeah. Wow. I mean, well, the producers, in particular, must be. Uh, I must give them their due uh, because they they really believe in what what's going on and they really uh, stood by it. You know, and supported it completely all the way, and and with that we went on to Venice and you know, everything else that, that 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 came before that came that happened for us. You know. Do you have any particular memories of filming that really stood out for you and had like a personal impact on you? The first day, the first day when we were we were shooting in Kenya, we were heading to the 
the, the uh, island in the middle of the lake to shoot. And we were in like, don't know how many boats and all heading towards the island. And on the island were these barges and these cranes, you know. As I approached it, I, I thought, wow. <laughs> It's like a real film like that. It's like really like a big film. No, I mean, all the while you've just been planning, 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 discussing. And then this, this is for the first time you see it. And, and about 100 over crew, you know. Almost, yeah, 100 something crew every day. Yeah. Some days, 200 something. Yeah. So it's huge, huge, huge. But though, I mean, the way I, I got through it was that I just focused on what I had to do and trusted that everybody would be doing the part because we already had all these discussions and meetings and then everything will happen. And then, of course, in, invariably, it happens in some way or another, you know? Yeah. So, so, so in the end, it ended up getting played at Venice Film Festival and was the first Malaysian film to be longlisted for Academy Awards. So. Because I'm not in the industry. Yeah. Like, how does that normally happen? Do you submit your film for these festivals? You have, you have to be submitted by an official body in Malaysia. Mm. And so, um, until that point, nobody has formed that official body. You know, uh, formed that official body to do the submission. And because of the, because of the, the film itself, and because of the people, the producers of the film, they felt that uh, it's time we did something like that. And so, they, they, Tina sort of got together a team to to form a submission submission body. So you have to submit, you say, declare that this film is representing representing your country and things like that. Yeah. So I mean, it was a real eye opener for all of us because none of us had ever been to an international film festival, and the amount of work and the machinery involved to actually get going. Is immense. I mean, we kind of knew when we landed in LA that we are not going to make it. You know, at that time we didn't know we are not on the short list yet. You know, or so. Um, but when we arrived, we saw billboards for all the other films, and they have special pullouts. And you know, in in the LA Times on the Sunday edition, they have booklets and all that. You know, all beautifully done and. I guess months of preparation for this. We kind of hey, let's do this. <laughs> let's put on a show. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, and so we go and we look at it. Go, oh my God, this is what it takes. I mean, we got a lot, a lot of mileage out of it ourselves. I mean, we interviewed on radio and on television, morning morning show on television, and and kindly invited to a lot of things, you know, but. We were quite involved in the process. We go like, wow, actually, it takes so much more, you know. I think and what was the film is one aspect of it. Wow, and what was it like going to like the Venice Film Festival? Unreal, really. It was just out of body experience. You kind of like you're kind of stunned into like <laughs> disbelief yourself, like no. When you arrive, the, the protocol in Venice is that you are made to wait in a holding area and then you every then they'll call you, you jump on the boat and you'll be taken and announced when you arrive on the at the venue, uh, the, the the jetty in front of the venue, you know, that sort of thing. So we were a bit late for some reason. And so the uh, uh, Johnny Depp went before us, went first. And then it was us. And then after this was Tom Cruise. <laughs> it's like your whole movie magazine just came alive and everybody is there. <laughs> you feel that. I mean, of course, we cannot get to them. We cannot get near them, even, you know, but to be able to see them live, you go like, it was such a thrill. I mean, for me, lah. <laughs> and then when we got to the, the, the HQ of uh, Venice, sort of the main venue of Venice, and to honor each one who comes, they'll fly your flight. Wow. Yeah, and we were close to tears. I mean, I must say we were close to tears. This, this is the first day. time the Malaysian flag is flown there, right? Mm. Unfortunately, my pictures from all those things have all been wiped out. <laughs> so, oh no! Yeah. How come? I know. That's no, such a I shame. mean, not, not this 
computer crash, previous computer crash. Okay. Like, what it all so I don't like uh, yeah. yeah. But it was really something that still in my very like uh, present in my memory. You know? Yeah. So after that, like, did you make a lot of connections? Were you trying to be able to do international collaborations? Um, not really. I came back and I spent two years going around uh, to all the different festivals. Things I went everywhere almost. Yeah, I went to San Francisco, went to Commonwealth Film Festival in Manchester, went to I can't even remember where it was. It went a lot, a lot of places. So it kind of like at least one and a half years I spent traveling for the for the film. So and it was all hunky dory because this is my first time, right? So and then I realized at the end of it, oh my god, I haven't done any writing. I've got no project to to the thing. So I better sit down and, and and prepare something. And then that took another year, I think. Yeah. So that's why there's a gap of like I think four years to the next thing. A year or so to the next thing. And was this the period where Mi Fang came in? She used to work in no, Australia. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. She came in at 2010, around there. Oh, um, okay. Two. Right, yeah. right. So, so then I, I, after the high of Putri Gunung Ledang, I made another film, and it was really not successful. You know, it was uh, um, all around bad experience for everyone involved, not just uh, me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, 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 want, I tried to do something, but it didn't work out, you know. So, uh, what do you think was the main there, reason for that? I wanted to do a black comedy, yeah, but um, in the end, uh, the people involved decided that they don't want it to be a black comedy and decided to sell it as a romantic comedy. And it didn't work, lah, because it was designed to be a black comedy, so it wasn't really, you know, yeah, it's unfortunate. Then, Nothing was happening, nothing was happening for a while. Yeah. Um, and I kind of got a little bit depressed. Not depressed, la. I mean, kind of like stuck in a rut. You know, you feel like, oh, I don't know what to do next, you know. And mm. uh, it wasn't like the office were pouring in. So, so you get kind of like, oh. <laughs> That's so strange yeah. that I would have thought after the high of Poetry of Google Laydown that everyone would want to jump on you because you were winning all these awards. You had done things no other Malaysian film had achieved. The thing that came from Putri Gunung Lay Down for everyone was that I was too big. I was too big uh, and I the things I do were cost too much for them to afford. Oh, wow. Yeah, it worked against me. It worked against me because um, there's a certain scale that Malaysia is used to. You know, the, the appetite for, for investment in film is at a certain level. And there is this film that is like so many more times above that level, you know, and that everybody was like quite reticent about approaching me, you know. So, so that's what happened. Mm. So you were and in this even the ones who wanted, even the ones who wanted to do a period drama didn't really realize how much it's going to cost, you know. So, so how much would it normally cost then for a period drama? You know, like, okay, recent, in recent years, uh, Nero Mahawansa cost a lot of money too, and so did Hanyu, you know, by two ways. I think Hanyu cost 25 million. Wow. And Nero was easily 15 million, you know. So uh, around there, you know, there about. But it's everything, because when you do a period drama, you have to find an isolated location, and you have to build everything from scratch. And everybody you see in there has to be styled, and their wardrobe has to be made. Their shoes have to be made. You know, everything you see about them has to be created. So it sucks up much more money than you expect. People go, yeah. And that's to even achieve the basics. I mean, we haven't even done a, a gladiator or anything like that. And it's really at the scale. But if you look at how things are done, you look at Game of Thrones. Okay, Game of Thrones one episode is fifteen thousand US million, fifteen million US. 
one episode. 60 million for one episode. We're not coming anywhere near it. Near, near that. Yeah. When Game of Thrones first started the very first season, it was 4 million an episode. I mean, for someone who's not in the industry, it's like, I cannot comprehend how it can be so high. No, it takes a, it takes a lot. And a lot of mm. uh, buying, and uh, you're managing a, a group of like few hundred people, two to three hundred people, you know? Yeah. Anything can go wrong, you know? Yeah. So you and are... Like, Game of Thrones, they go to all the exotic locations and all that. So that adds to the cost. Same as us, even climbing in the mountain, even shooting at the sea. These are horribly difficult things to do, you know. And because anywhere else you shoot, you will see telecommunication towers, you will see electrical, electrical pylons, and all that, you know. And in those days when I was shooting it, it wasn't computer graphics wasn't so so uh, up to speed, you know. Yeah. I remember when we were doing the computer graphics for Trigonal Ladan, you make one small change. You, you preview the computer graphics against the live action. You make one change, you have to come back the next day to review that change. Mm. It, it takes so long to even process. Mm. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, now, I mean, to keep that up, how can that be, you know? Because you just, your processing speed is so fast, you know? But it, it was a completely different ballgame. Wow. Yeah. So you're doing all these things, you were stuck in a the rut, then what happened? I got this call from Nifa. Um, Nifa, whom I met when she was at Astro. And then at that point when she called me, she was partners with Lina Tan at Red, Redcom, Red Films. So she called me, she said, uh, how are you? I said, I'm okay. And then she said, hey, do you mind if I bring a phone show event to your house? <laughs> and I said, well, this is odd. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I appreciate her for her candor, you know, like she was completely up and she said, it just seems that you should be doing better, but um, you don't seem to be doing well, you know? So I, I think maybe you might need your feng shui check, she said, you know? So of course the other thing, I mean, I wasn't doing well when she, that point, and she said, so my, my first question was, how much is this going to cost, this feng shui thing? And she said, no, no, it's on me, my treat. So I said, okay. <laughs> Why not? So I said, okay. Yeah. I said, okay. And then she sent the feng shui person over. And his advice was for me to move out from where I was living immediately. So he said, no, you can't be here. This, you will go nowhere in this, in this uh, apartment where I was staying at that point. Because the location, everything was bad, right? I think. Yeah. He said, my front door was in the conflict, my conflict area. And my wealth sector is in my toilet. So he said, and you know, apartment you cannot move. Things, your front door you cannot move, your toilet you cannot move. So he said, there's no way I can fix this for you. You have to move. And of course, it was a big problem because moving, you know, you have to pay deposit, you have to find a house, you have to look for the rental every month, and things like that. And so that was another issue. But, um, but Mi Fang and, and Lina kindly. Uh, agreed to advance me some money to enable me to move and then I will work on their next project for them to offset the cost. You know? And I did that and I managed to find a place back in Bangsa. I used to live in Bangsa area then I moved to this place in Ampang. Then I moved back to Bangsa and, and then everything started to pick up. I mean, strangely, whether you were... Maybe my, my situation was so dire that anything was up, <laughs> any which way would yeah. be up for me. So it, it just picked up and um, yeah, I got a couple of things going, you know, and then I, I, I got back on my feet. Yeah. I think you were so, like directing TV series and movies and a stage musical yeah, as well? I, correct. So uh, I did two TV series for them. I did one called Sankal the Sea for Astro first. And then I did uh, a web series for um, a branded content series for Conmesco. It's also via Red, Red as well. And so those were my only two exposures to television. And then uh, at the same time, a friend of mine in Penang, Joe Sidek, he, he, he became the festival director for Georgetown Festival. 
And so he called me and he said, Hey, you want to do something? <laughs> because it was also his first time as a festival director, and I've never done theatre before. So I said, Yeah, yeah, I want to do. <laughs> I want to do Emily or Emma here. But I want to do Emily in the story, Emily as like as a child, as a, a woman, and then as an old lady. You know? So but I wanted to do this Emily, which is a famous monologue, right? It's a monodrama, one one actress. But I want to do it with three of the most famous enemies playing these three parts. Playing the young one, playing the middle, uh, the lady, and then playing the old old one. And there's another twist. We are going to do this Emily over three nights. And every three nights, the combination changes. Oh. That means the lady who plays the young girl will play the old lady the next night, and will play the middle lady the third night, and, and they all switch. So I managed to stick to Kuei Jin and Furley and uh, Sri Lin in Singapore, the three famous family, and they all agreed to do it. And then we did it and we, uh, Kung Yu did the set design, which was stunning, you know, and, and then we put it all together. And uh, it took up a big part of Joe's budget, but I mean, he was also very gung ho and very supportive, and he believed, he was very excited by it, and he believed in it, and we, we went through with it, and it was a uh, Great success for all of us, you know. This but I can still remember what Poitin said to me at the, at the end of the process. He said, Tell him, I will never do this switching again. <laughs> I said, Why? I mean, she was very serious. She sat me down and she said, she said I don't believe I agreed to do this uh, for you. But I, I know for sure now I will never do it again. Oh, no. <laughs> I said, Why? Because she said, You know, we all know the text inside out. Right? Because we are all played Emily many times before. They know it inside. But when I split it into middle, old age, um, uh, young, middle, and old, and then switch their roles every night, they don't know at which point do they stop. You have to really focus on what the other person is saying, and then you say, oh, now it's my team to go on. So she said, you know how, how big a headache I have every night? <laughs> you know, you just... Standing by, listening, 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 and then go. <laughs> because you know it inside out, so you have a tendency to maybe go earlier or go, you know? Yeah, yeah you think her line is your line, it just blurs, right? Yeah, correct, because you know all the lines. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm grateful to all of them for doing it. And they did it beautifully, beautifully. And this happened in 2010, and because of Emily, you were taken seriously as like a theatre director, right? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I kind of, I mean, I don't know, like, nobody actually got, like, one person came up to me and said, my God, it was so wonderful, and you kind of renewed my, my love for theatre and all that. This, I mean, this is from somebody in the industry that I, I respect, you know, mm. so, yeah. Sure. And you continue to work with Joe today on Scylla in 2012 as well. Yeah, correct. I also worked with him on 2012 and worked with him on 2014. And, and both, did, uh, hi. The world. Yeah. yeah. So Emily and Sila, actually, as I understand it, they were like big risks for you guys, right? Because you were doing unconventional things. Yeah, I did it not as a stage play. I did it as an immersive experience because in the story, Emily is famous for throw, throwing banquets in the story because she's from like a rich man's wife and she throws these banquets to to kind of like socialize with all the right people, you know, to make all the right connections for her son and everything. So we devised it as a ball. So I made it like an immersive experience in that when people arrive, uh, there's a cocktail. So they're all drinking cocktail and everything and then uh, Emily appears. And so I do a chunk of the dialogue there first and then she leads them all upstairs. So they, and they all sit down to a, to dinner, a piranha sand dinner. Like as, because in the text, they describe the food quite um, clearly and very specific. They had uh, this type of food, that food, that food, that food. So we replicated the experience. Then, so, and in the in the ball itself, we had some pedestals for the actresses, the three actresses, actresses to be on, and then we kept switching. But because the ballroom was quite long, we had to have video support. You know, 
So let's say because if you sat at one end of the ballroom, when the actress at the other end is, is on, you cannot see her and vice versa, right? So we had close up of all the actresses on a huge screen, like a ballroom screen like that, lah. like a ballroom where like people's wedding, that time they have a huge stage, right? So we created that. Yeah. So yeah, it worked really well. I mean, it's one of the proudest things, uh, things I'm proudest of. So 2010, 2012, and then 2014 is Haiki Sinlo. And actually, this script, you wrote all the way back, I understand, in 2009. And you wrote it as a, meant to be a film, right? So, right? so this is something that's something like a semi-autobiographical like, story of your life when you were growing up. And it's something very dear to you. Can you share like, what was the inspiration behind you starting to write this? Actually, it was for a Sina's writing workshop. Mm. There was a Sina's writing workshop. Sina's is the film body in Malaysia in charge of uh, the film industry. So um, we are supposed to write a, a piece and then bring it to the workshop and share and then uh, I guess, what do you call it? Workshop it lah. You yeah. know what I mean? Lah? Like, because there are other writers and all that. You know? So I, I started writing. I, at that point also, I felt that after the disappointment of the second film, I, and I felt that I want to do something really meaningful to myself. Like really... Um, so I wrote, like what they say, write what you know, you know? So, and I, I always wanted to write about um, coming to terms with my family, that sort of thing. So I sat and wrote it. It kind of wrote itself pretty quickly, you know? I mean, there was a, a surplus of material actually. Too much material. I wrote, like like vomit. So there's so much out there. Then I, I had to spend the time to edit to say, okay, what is the true line? What is the story? What is the story I want to say? And just throw it away and then um, and then prepare for the workshop. Then, so how long was that whole process of writing? I think the writing, the first round writing was three days. The wow. whistling was another four days. And, and, and because it's from a lived experience, so you kind of know it, you know, and you, know, you don't have to create anything, you know. Mm. You kind of like, you know the characters very well. And, and sort of thing. So I presented it and then um, reaction was actually mixed to the script. I also shared the script with a couple of close friends and strongly encouraged not to make it. <laughs> oh, wow. H how come? You see, it, it won't look good for you, you know? Mm. But for me, it wasn't a point of looking, my looking good or not. It's a point, it's more for me to get it off my chest. And also like, sort of like, like I always say in my interviews before, a, tri a tribute to my mom, you know, like, uh, an apology, if you like, a little belated, but all the same, I think it needs to be stated that um, I misunderstood her. So, so I, I, that was the most important thing for me. So but even that? at the workshop, some, some, some of the reaction was, aren't you embarrassed to wash your own dirty laundry, you know, in public? For me, it's not dirty laundry. I mean, I don't look at it that way. It's, part and parcel of who I am, you know, I mean, I'm not going to pretend that I come from an immaculate background or anything like that, you know, or, you know, this is what I am or who I am, so, so, so be it lah, you know, um, but however it's received, I will, I will leave with it, you know. And had you already shared this script with your family at the time, did they know you were doing this? I didn't, not yet, um, it was only at the play, when I was staging the play, that I invited them to the play. You know, so that was because, the first time they heard about it? Yeah, that's the first time I heard about it. And so my my sister, one of my sisters, two of my sisters turned up. Two of my sister, my auntie that I invited with him turned up. Um, and then, yeah, only two of my sisters turned up. But it's very interesting, the reaction. One of the sisters said, I don't sound like that. <laughs> You, you know, I mean, like what I said, I saw myself as a quiet, shy boy in school, and my friends saw me as a chatterbox in school, you know what I mean? We have very different 
how we see ourselves and how others see us is, can be completely different, you know. So, yeah, but... But the journey to getting that onto the stage was like, there was a lot of trials, right? I understand the eve before the performance, there was this huge thunderstorm that really yeah. caused a lot of problems. I mean, again, I didn't choose to do things easy. The easy I didn't take the easy way. Like, for example, just to go back to Silat in the 2012, we did it outdoors in Fort Cornwallis, in Fort Cornwallis, in the open air with a uh, gamelan orchestra and with performers and like a lot of performers and all that. So, <laughs> so every night you're like shooting great. <laughs> <laughs> because there's no, no, no contingency. It's like you're really out there. If it rains, the whole thing is just washed out, you yeah. know? But thank God we, we made it through, you know? Because the, the thing, the reason why I'm so particular about that is because Georgetown Festival was created to celebrate um, Penang's listing, Georgetown's listing in the World Heritage site, as the World Heritage site. So I want to do events at World Heritage site. You know, the, like, let's say, for example, the, the first one, Emily, was done in, you know, what do you call that building? I cannot remember that building. Next to the Padang, uh, there was a, a building there. And then uh, Fort Cornwallis is also a World Heritage Site. And then the third one was obviously Kukomsi, which is also a World Heritage Site, you know. But then it means taking a certain amount of risk. Lah. I mean, like I said, honestly, I've been lucky that the people, uh, like Josie, they really believed in what I wanted to do and supported it completely and took the risk with me. Now, I mean, honestly, if the, if the investor or producer don't or like for PGL and all that, if they don't believe in the idea, you will go nowhere with it. You know, you can we can think the most brilliant things but without without the trust or support or belief, it will not happen. You know? So what was it that if you don't mind sharing the story behind before the stage performance? Because it was quite okay. a I mean, even the rehearsal process was fraught for me because, mm -hmm. I mean, writing is one thing. It was really quite, quite um, unsettling for me and I mean, copious amounts of tears were shed, you know, as I was writing it. But when you were rehearsing it, seeing these people be the characters, doing things, coming alive, was really difficult for me, you know, and, and, and that. Actors were very, very good about it. And even the people, the production team around me were very good about it. And they supported me as much as they could, you know. So, already it was quite, yeah, difficult, challenging uh, process. And then the night before the rehearsal, the full dress rehearsal, the full dress rehearsal, it started to rain really heavily as we were putting up the things. And then, Lightning struck the top of the Kukong Sea. You know the, the ornate ceiling with yeah. all the stone carvings on it? Struck the stone carving, the stone carving came crashing down. What are the chances? Broke, broke the back windscreen of a car and cut one of the technicians uh, uh, putting up the stage. And not only that, because the wind and the rain were so strong, we put up a screen. I don't know if you saw the production, we had a projection on the screen before the action starts, the screen cra came crashing down. And we had only started our lighting scheme. That means we had only just barely started to oh, check this light, check that light there. We haven't even done the walkthrough. We haven't even done the, we had just, I mean, that means the first part of the walkthrough that they stand in position to get the light. And we haven't even finished the audio, but we had to, we had to stop. I could call it, call, call it off, call it a night because we had to fix the stage, we had to send the people to the hospital, we had to, you know, and it was raining so heavily we cannot continue, you know. So we started fixing. And then the next day was the day of the performance, right? The performance is at, I think it was 7.30 or it was not, 7, mm -hmm. 7 o'clock, 7.30, 7.30, um, 7.30, sorry. So we all stood by, stand by, stand by in the, like after lunch because we were still fixing everything. We didn't finish fixing anything until 6 o'clock or something. 
So there's no way we could have a rehearsal because you already have to go into makeup and get ready to go, go into wardrobe ready. And then that means the audio has never been tested and the lighting, they kind of kind of do on their own. Agha Anta is going to be like this, like that. So I thought, I'm going to die like a dog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to really die like a dog, you know? Um, yeah. But what you do, I'm committed to you. Just have to stick it through and make sure you get through. Then the show started. It was magical. Seriously, it was magical. Even if I say so myself. I mean, there's been some uh, reviews on it that have been very, very kind, you know, and some like really, really full of praise, and you know, but it's magic. It just, it was the best performance ever. I guess because everybody might be on an edge and nobody wants to fuck up. <laughs> the adrenaline is <laughs> pumping. <laughs> yeah. All the actors and the technical crew, the sound guy, you know, can you imagine not testing? Anything could have gone wrong, you know. So, and also on the first night, we were due to start at seven thirty, and then before we started, we were reminded that the azan comes on uh, around seven forty, seven thirty-five comes on seven forty. So we had to wait for the azan. So, but it was magical because here in the darkened uh, uh, space outdoor with the with the stage and the uh, not the temple, it's like a ancestral. Uh, place, you know, in, in, in darkness, it's just a small key light when you hear the azan, and then after that, the, the show starts. There's a, there's one piece of writing that captured that magic really nicely. Yeah. Uh, in, in Harper's, I think it was in Harper's first time. Yeah. And what was your feeling seeing this come to life in front of you for the first time? I wept. <laughs> I mean, all four nights, I think we had four nights performing. All four nights, I went. Because not, the first night was especially um, heavy because, because of the, uh, the pressure. But also watching it come to life, you just cannot help but get sucked into this catharsis thing, you know? I mean, uh, it has just finished for me, you know what I mean? So even if it spilled over into making of the film, even you know, it wasn't just. So the, the whole process took a long time. So can you imagine I've been carrying around that baggage for forty over fifty years, fifty over years? You know, it's crazy. But that's what we do to ourselves. Yeah. Do you feel that it was like the because you're doing this as a tribute to your mom, right? Do you feel that release from you when you saw that? English? Yeah, I I feel like a. I feel like less a monster because my, my hatred for my brother was really not nice. You know, I, I mean, I really resented him. You know, so, and I was completely wrong about him. I'm sympathetic and wrong about him. But I mean, the nicest thing was one of my cousins came to watch the film and he said, I was so afraid that you, he said, I was so afraid that you would be unfair, but you were not. Mm. You know, that, that, that was something I strive to do. You know, because it's not a vendetta. It's not for me to shame anyone or to it's just to try to tell it as as honestly as I remember it. it, it you know, and you know memory is not the most reliable thing, you know. Do you feel yeah. like you would have done it because I understand there was like opposition, right? Would you have still done it if your family had been like very strongly opposed to having your story shown? I, I think I would, you know, because it's just something I needed to do. But yeah. I mean, what was interesting is I wanted to shoot in the flat that my sister lived in, her actual flat. And uh, she said yes initially, but I think a week before shooting, she changed her mind and said no. So I mean, I kind of, I mean, it was, was very inconvenient for me, but I kind of respected that and, and just looked for another place. Yeah. So before we go into that film part, like so going back to the stage play, the reception I understand was like very, very good. Was it something that surprised you that people really connected with it? Yeah. Like you also gave free passes to those who live 1km within Haiki Singh Law, is that right? Really on the first night. 
because because the thing is that the first night uh, was the screening for the uh, not screening a show for the residents. Show for, because you know when you do in a play, you're disrupting their life and the, the noise level and all that. And all that. So, um, Georgetown Festival decided to do the one show, and also because uh, Kuo Kong sponsored the venue. So, so uh, for Kuo Kong and the people living around there, uh, this was like a thank you to them. You know. they, the, the response was beyond my expectations. Maybe the best review of my career, actually. The really career best. And I think after the success of those four days, people were willing to fund you to do the film version. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, because when you read the story on the page, it's all doom and gloom. It's all mm. doom and gloom, right? But when you see it perform, there's a certain redemption. There's a certain sense of redemption uh, uh, involved. And that, there's a certain uplift at the end that doesn't read on paper, you know? So, so um, yeah. So that, and it was also the, f- the first Penang mm-hmm. Hokkien film as well, so that was like, whoa! Something different. That was another, another problem in itself. <laughs> <laughs> so because yeah. earlier in when when I was trying to get money for the film, I had a couple of incident instances when I couldn't have got the film made, but provided I changed it to memory. But I just couldn't see because it's about my family. I just couldn't see imagine them. Speaking Mandarin, you know, to me it would be so weird, and I couldn't get my head around it, you know. So I didn't, I didn't do it, and it stuck in my time. Yeah, and then finally it happened. So you got the funding, and then you started preparing the set. I think in the end of two thousand fifteen. In terms of like the cast and the production team, like was it very difficult for you to identify people for those roles? Actually. Um, I had a, my initial uh, reaction, my initial impulse was to use all the same cast on play. Yeah, but in film, there, there were different requirements because film is a much bigger investment. And so the producers needed some more famous names, more famous faces, you know. Uh, so I had to switch. I had to switch out some of the people. I mean, to the credit of the cast, they were very un- the theatre cast, they were very un- I went up to the to tell them personally that some of them, some of you won't be in the play, you know, I won't be in the film. And, and, yeah. Yeah. And was it difficult to like, especially for your family members, to identify the right actors for them? I think after the play, the. I forgot to say something about the play. The play the first night was shocking. When the play ended, okay, aside from myself crying and all that, when the first night the play finished, there was total silence, not a single applause. And you go like, huh? Then through my tears, I realized what happened here. And then you look around. But everybody was so engaged that they just sat. And kind of like, it's quite a, a gut punch as well because it's quite an emotional and then the applause started, but there was a, a delay, and then it went it went crazy. And then, but there were people who couldn't even move from their seats. I mean, there was this young two sisters, very young, I think mid or late twenties at the most, and the security guard had to help them walk out because they just couldn't get out. They were so crying so much. <laughs> <laughs> And it's not nice of me to laugh. <laughs> but, I mean, no, but it, the I impact would, was there. You never think, you never think of it. You know, I mean that, that you affect somebody so much. You know, I dare to say. I mean, I've been told lah by all the people that everybody cried. Nobody, not one person, not cried. Yeah, no, it, it's it's emotional. Like I was watching the behind the scenes, and I almost cried just watching the behind the scenes, not even the film itself, because it's the, it's something that's so raw and is like you can identify with it. I think, yeah, theatre and film has a way of amplifying. You know what I mean? Yeah, or or like. 
truth to him. You know, there's something in it that when you watch, how are you engaged by some things and you are not engaged by others? Is it just good acting or is it truth? Is there some truth in me? You know what I mean? Uh, that you identify with. I mean, uh, I'm not the I'm not a great expert on this, but I believe that we all have a built-in bullshit detector. Yeah. You know, you make sure your life you look to somebody, and somebody's telling you something, and you're thinking, oh, this person's lying. You know, what I mean, uh, it's it's a reflex that you action almost. You don't think about it. You know. Um, so. Yeah, so when, when something is honest, I guess, it, it cuts through. Mm. And what was it like going to start, because I understand you started shooting 1st January 2016, and you walk on and it was the set of your childhood home, right? So what was it like seeing it before you again? Unreal as well, again unreal. You know, like you was it, oh, the art department did such a fantastic job that I mean, they they had some description from me and then they did some set drawings and you know then I said okay it's more like this like that whatever but when when they recreated it it was I mean you know like so real um, it was unsettling to be honest I was really unsettled by it and when you see the rehearsal it's even worse you know when you see the re re reenactment you know. I guess you just like feel that like you're living the memory again, you know? Yeah, because yeah, you gave quite a lot of details to them, right? Down to the little yeah. bits and pieces of yeah. where everything should be placed. They were, they were an excellent team. The whole production team was excellent. Yeah. And what was it like directing the actors and actresses? I was watching all these interviews saying that like at the end of shoots, you, you guys were all crying together because <laughs> it was so emotional. <laughs> And I think one of them said, I've never cried with my director after doing a piece so, of work. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's like, you're the first director that like, sometimes cried before me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. Um, yeah, I get really engaged. I mean, even as an audience, I get really engaged. Can, can, engage. can you imagine as a director? You know, so you get really like, yeah. What was the thing that stood out for you the most in the entire filming? In where? Uh, in the entire yeah. filming process? Yeah, during the show. Like what stood out or had the biggest impact on you personally? There were certain signs almost, you know, um, when we were safe from the brink of disaster so many times on the shoot itself. Oh. In what sense? Yeah, we, I couldn't get into my school. I mean, Saint I was from Saint Xavier's in Chennai, and I couldn't get to my school. And I was just talking to a friend, and uh, I mentioned to him I cannot get to school. And he said, "Why don't you take my son's school? My son's school is very pretty, you know." Then <laughs> it, it didn't happen like that. And then I was talking. I was looking for a warehouse to be like a studio where the shoot is happening, right? Yeah, it's like a story, a shoot within a shoot, then, right? And he said, "Hey." He owns the cinema, you know, the empty cinema. So he said, Why don't you use my cinema? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, I mean, it became even more resonant. You know, it, it been shot in a, in, in a cinema that was where, where in the story where my mom, mom and I used to go and watch a movie before, you know. So, so all these things happened. And when we shot in the cinema, we built the set and everything, and then night before the shot shoot there was a flood oh no somebody forgot to turn up somebody forgot to turn up the tap and there was a flood the whole studio was flooded so i got a call very early in the morning from my producer my co-producer and he said to me hey there's a flood but we're managing it so so we, we drained the uh, managed to drain the water you laugh <laughs> it's like this thing happened on the oh my gosh in production so, and luckily it didn't damage the set. It only reached until the floor. But what was fantastic about it is that because the day before we went in to rehearse the scene and we blocked the scene, like the camera, where the camera is going to go and all that, and it was really dusty. It was really, really dusty. And then because of the flood, it was not. It was clean and all that. So, 
something good happened, came out of it, although it, it, it felt very much like a disaster as it happened, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I mean, I must say for the record that, for the record that, um, the support of the production team is pretty amazing, you know? Everybody kind of caught me up, you know? And, and my, my DOP and my uh, Chris Doyle, you know, and then uh, my first AD, um, and my co-producer, everybody, art department, everybody went the extra amount in the project, you know. I mean, to be honest, the ending also, the ending of the film came from one uh, uh, brainstorming session we had. We were traveling out from Penang to, uh, from KL to Penang, and I was in the van, I said, I hate my ending, I don't like my ending. <laughs> you know, I cannot bring the... I cannot bring the adult Sunny back to his, uh, to his mother. You know what I mean? Not, um, because they don't exist in the same frame, you know, at the same time. I cannot get, get it together, you know, get them together. And then the production manager said, why don't you do a rehearsal? Make it a rehearsal. Then rehearsal, they'll be facing each other. <laughs> okay, very good. Go home and change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was a very, very good suggestion. Yeah. I mean, I can just, this tends to be my process. I mean, I kind of like quite open about my my situation or transparent about my process and, and I invite a contribution, you know? Yeah. I mean, my first baby also, I mean, I was, I had a one take scene, like one single take scene. I used it in another part and she said, actually, why don't you use it here? It's better. You know, and I, I benefited from that as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think like Chris Dwell, he's quite a wonderful cinematographer, right? He also impacted the way you directed because he goes by feel, right? As opposed to like the technical. And also his energy. Doing. His mm. energy. I was a little bit more laid back and more, I guess, um, stayed. But he is a ball of energy and he's a, he's a whirlwind, you know? So that kind of brought the pictures, uh, gave a different dimension to the pictures as well. You know? yeah. And I he speaks such he, good Mandarin. I was shocked. <laughs> he reads Mandarin too and he speaks Cantonese as well. Oh my yeah. God. Yeah, he, he is actually a remarkable man. He's remarkable. So and when to you... have his support, I'm so grateful. Uh, how how did he end up getting involved? And I think you also got like the Taiwanese singer Dao Chun to sing the theme song, right? How did all these other people get involved? Okay, the Taiwanese element were actually was the work of my co-producer, uh, Leonard T. So uh, Leonard T has made uh, some Taiwanese films before uh, with Tai Ming Liang, his Chinese producer, and uh, so he's familiar with the uh, the players or uh, the, the key people in Taiwan. So he. The editing um, editing supervisor is a very famous editor in Taiwan, and he, because of Leonard's uh, connection with him, he kindly agreed to help us uh, restructure the, the, the film. And also, um, the composer of the song, David Kuhn and his, and his wife, the music, um, Previously used to be based in Taiwan and they wrote a few hit songs for some of the popular singers there and they have since come back to Malaysia and started a music um, music academy. So um, we got them to write the song for us. It was beautiful, beautiful song. And because of their yeah, connection and also um, Leonard's connection, we, we got uh, first Chow Chuan. Chow Chuan was David's connection, but um, Leonard is a very persuasive talent. So <laughs> he helped seal the deal, you know. So uh, that happened. Um, my contact with Chris Doll was via Walter. Walter was uh, one of the co-owners of uh, Fortissimo Films. Fortissimo Films is a specialist shop that does uh, art house Asian cinema. So I mean, the late Walter, he passed away. Um, I think, what year did he pass away? I can't remember now. So, um, he was 
I shared the script with him. I met him in, in KL once and I shared the script with him and he was interested. And he, he got me to fly to Hong Kong to meet with him. And when I went to Hong Kong, he, he had a dinner. He organized a dinner with Chris Doyle and a few other people that he thought should be involved in this film. And then he got them to say, you all must support this guy. Wow. <laughs> support me. <laughs> yeah. And then I went back, I came back from Hong Kong very happy, but uh, Walter had a heart attack, unfortunately. Uh, and then in two weeks, I think two or three weeks from then, and passed away. And so the film went in limbo, went into limbo, you know. So, but when I managed to get the money together, I contacted Chris again. And I said, I've managed to do this. Would, would you still be interested, you know? Then he said, of course, let me have a look at the script first. And I sent him the script and then he said, yes. You know, so, I mean, but to alleviate both our concerns, we organized for him to come to Malaysia for a week to shoot the trailer. Because we want to see whether he can work with, because we couldn't afford for him to bring his whole, whole team. Only he comes, but he works with the all Malaysian team. You know, so whether they can get along and uh, the different ways of working and all that. So he came and we did that and everything went well. So that was good. It's just incredible to see like doing this big production is all these connections through people, through people, through people and it's just like serendipitous yeah. events that come together. Right? Actually in life, everything is all relationships. People can say it's cronism, you can call it whatever you want but between two people who are similarly qualified, you will work with somebody that you know. Let's be honest, you know what I mean? Or somebody you'll be comfortable with. Whatever your own problems are, you know what I mean? The issues could be yours and not the other person's, but you will naturally go that way, you know? So that's the whole, that's how everything takes up. And every industry is the same, you know? You work with an, let's say, estate agent that you're comfortable with, you know, rather than yeah. any other estate agent. That's even going out, even going out to eat somewhere, you ask your friends first, where can I go to eat? Yeah, correct, correct. Yeah, even that, especially in these times, I mean, you tend to go back to places where you feel safe, where you can trust the hygiene. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So. Kai Kisina was released to critical acclaim. Was this something that you were surprised by? Like, what were you expecting? Um, I'm always surprised, actually. You know, because I try to have no expectations. You know, I try, I mean, I, of course, I want everything to succeed as best it can. You know, and, and the rest, you just... Surrender, lah. I guess surrender to the universe. Whatever happens, is whatever happens, you know. So, I mean, the easiest an analogy is like having children. You have a child. What you want your child to succeed, you know. But how far your child succeeds, or in what ways that your child succeeds, is not up to you. You know, if somebody adopts it and makes it their film, their go-to film or their recommended film, fantastic. If somebody looks at it and has no reaction to it, it's also valid, you know. So you you, you don't know. You never you never know which way it's gonna go. And how did your family feel seeing them up on the silver screen this time? I think the most used adjective was brave, <laughs> brave of courage. You know, yeah, I mean, I don't feel particularly brave or courageous, but. It just felt that it was necessary that I do it, you know. Yeah. So it's not, it's nothing else but that a necessity on my part. You know? yeah. And I read as well you were doing this film because you wanted to find your true voice as like an identity as a filmmaker. Do you feel that that happened as well? Okay, I mean I would say it's closest to my true voice, but I've also come to the realization that there's no such thing as a true true voice. Because you're relying on a cameraman, you're relying on uh, um, uh, art director, yeah, you're relying on an editor, you know. There's so many elements of it that has other people's contribution, you know. 
it, it's close. It's close to my voice, I must say, to my, my true voice. But I be, after that experience making high pitch in the the world to me, I realized that maybe it doesn't truly exist unless you edit everything yourself, unless you shoot it yourself, you know, the expression of it will always have some interpretation. Yeah. Is it possible for you to define what your true voice, if you will, is? I think to some degree I'm sentimental, largely I'm sentimental and also optimistic. You know, um, but in all the work I do, there's always um, someone who dies. <laughs> Okay, I didn't come to this observation all by myself. Somebody yeah. told me. <laughs> you may not know your friend, somebody died. Oh no. Yeah, yeah it's true. <laughs> yeah. So it makes the yeah. people who are alive like that much like more precious, I suppose. I guess it's a yeah, it kind of escalates things, you know, put things into yeah, focus. You know? Yeah, for me lah. And also there's also uh, underlying theme of love, maybe parent, uh, parental love, or maybe romantic love, or what. There's always um, a belief in the purity of love, you know, in, in, in true love. You know? yeah. Yeah. Is there anything? Misguided the... silly or not? Yeah. I said the... misguided silly or not. That's what I believe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's at the yeah. core of us as humans, right? We all want to be loved. Yeah, we want it. we want some form of expression of that, you know. Yeah. Looking back, is there anything that you would want to redo, like in the making of this film? I think no director. It's quite safe to say no director hundred percent happy with anything that they've done. I don't. I I would safely say that you know. Mm. But at the same time. Would I do it any differently? My thing is that my answer would be no. I think because I mean, at every point, I did the best I could, and I mean sometimes the best you can is great. Sometimes the best you can is not so great. So you just have to live with it. You know, yeah. Yeah. pretty much like life. <laughs> right? Yeah. And that is like with the release of this film, there was also the love campaign that was like launched by um, Astro featuring five families. Yeah. I thought it was very, very yeah. special that it wasn't just your story, but other people's stories as well, including a mother with a child who had like, mental challenges as well. Correct, yeah. But you see, that's what a lot of people feel to see when, when they first read the script. You know, is that it's not just about my family, it's about a situation that we all invariably find ourselves in in some in some degree or other. You know? Yeah. I mean every family is the same. There's a lot of love and there's also a lot of resentment. At various points you ask that somebody asks you, how do you feel about your mother? Oh I hate her. Oh I love her. You know what I mean? And it's all and they're both true. It's not that you're lying, you know? It's it's this that's what makes it so special and so intriguing to me. You know? How um, how is how are brothers and sisters so close to each other aside from growing up together? I mean, a lot of times brothers and sisters grow up, although they grow up in the same house, they grow up separately. They don't really do everything together except eat meals together or you know that sort of thing. And yet there's this really strong bond that ties us. True, you know. It's, yeah, I guess because you see every aspect of them you know and you come to expect even the not so nice not so pleasant aspect that 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 is the basis for a stronger love you know yeah because the idealistic love wears out quite quickly you know? you, re you realize that it's always in place the idealism <laughs> yeah. do you feel like there was did you see a like long lasting impact that your movie had on people around you only time can tell. Yeah. You know, only time will tell what's going to happen, how it's going to be received. And, and I mean, hopefully, 
in future when people look back on it, even on some of my less successful films, they'll be kinder, you know? Yeah. So this film was released in 2017, and that same year you were also doing the Southeast Asia Games. You were the creative director. Yeah. How did that come yeah. about? Because you were doing the opening and the closing ceremony. Yeah, and the Para Games as well. Yeah. yeah. It was... I mean... I've been a tr- tremendously lucky person. Okay. I said this at the talk, I guess. Um, like growing up watching cinema, watching movies and all that in the cinema, you never imagine, I never imagined I'll be a director, you know. I'll be, I'll be involved in any way because it was so far from my existence, from my reality. And for me to end up being a director and I'm a rather successful one in the sense that I can sustain myself based on what I do is already a big gift. It's the same with watching Olympic opening ceremony and all that through the years you watch and you go, wow, this is fantastic. If I get the chance to do something, it'd be amazing. You know, I'm still waiting for the call from the Olympics. <laughs> 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 I I got an opportunity to do, do the Southeast Asian game, you know, and which is mind blowing in itself. You know, it, it happened really left field, really took me by surprise. Because when I was making my third film, Gofu Rei Rei, which is a musical tribute to Sudirman, it is a musical with Sudirman songs, I contacted Sudirman's uh, manager before, um, Darani. So I contacted Darani and I told him that I'm making him, I'm making a film about that. And then he said to me, actually you don't, um, you don't have to get any clearance from me because the rights to the songs are owned by um, EMI and all that, you know what I mean? Uh, so I said, no, 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 it's not, I'm, it's just a courtesy, I need to, I want to tell you that I'm doing this and doing this song, right? you know, I just touched base with you. And that was seven years or eight years before the season. That's 2017, 2004, 2013, 2017, six years, six years before the season. Seven years, seven years. So, that was the only contact we had. So thank you very much, you know. Yeah. And then 2016, he called me. 2016, he called me and he said, Hey, Jong Hen, uh, want to have a drink? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's going on. So I had a drink and then he said, Would you be interested in doing the sea game? I said, yeah, I said it's a pitch, you know, we are going into a pitch situation. Would you be interested to pitch with us? So I said, yeah. And then we were given a very short time to come up with this thing. I think two weeks or so, or so we were pitching in two weeks or three weeks. Uh, very, very short. Maybe. Yeah. So I, I went, like, locked myself in and went, did all my research and all that and came up with the concept for it and, and, and detailed it out and presented it to them first internally and they loved it and then we presented it to the ministry and they loved it and then we were surprisingly appointed because these things are usually um, done way before you know what I mean so it's never done so close to the um, so close to the time it was Third quarter, I think, third quarter or last quarter of 2016 that we pitched. Wow. And the SEA Games was like the following August. So yeah, yeah, less than a year. Yeah, less than a year to prep it. So... What was the experience of doing that? It was wildly different from a film. <laughs> it is wildly different. and I mean, the creative process is the same. But you're dealing with half a thousand, there were yeah. 3,000 people involved in the show. I think three or 4,000 people involved in the show. So again, it's trust. you got to trust. you got to trust that everybody will do their bit. you got to trust that you no know, people won't let you down. You know, if you go and worry, you cannot worry for 3,000 people or 4,000 people. You know, is that, is that person going to get enough sleep? Is that person going to get injured or wake up or come on time? You cannot. You just trust. Trust it. Okay, everyone, we are doing this, you know, 
you want to do this, right? Yeah. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> That's all. Yeah. I mean, I've got no great advice or anything, but I operate on that. You know, that, that the belief that everybody wants to do their best. So you just share your vision and then, I mean, of course, there, sometimes there'll be challenges. Some people will ask you why and all that, and you explain the best you can. And then you, you actually rely on them, you count on them to do their best. That's the only way you can get the result, you know? And do you feel like being involved in the SEA Games had a big impact on your career after that? Like, what was your plan after? There was some interest, um, like for events and all that as well. I mean, from out of the country and all that. But um, I went for the pitch, but it didn't happen. You know, and so something in Indonesia, something in Philippines, and you know, a couple of other things that uh, we're talking about locally as well. We wanted to take a show and just go on the road, tour internationally with it. You know, so a lot of interesting things that. Interesting possibility, but that, that hasn't landed yet. So maybe the time is not right, you know. Yeah. I don't know. And how do you feel that, like, because this is 2020, like, how has COVID impacted you and your industry? Ah, I think nobody saw it coming. You know, for sure, nobody saw this coming. And as such, I don't think anybody was prepared for this, you know. So, I mean, our industry is hand to mouth for the most part. You know, and I'll be very honest about it. And it's not the most lucrative industry. So, for a lot of the uh, industry practitioners, it's a really, really rough time. Really rough time. And so, I don't know. I mean, hopefully, there'll be a vaccine soon and, and we can all get back on our feet. You know? So, you can only try. La. I mean, again, I'm not just thing that you can only try your best. Every time you get an opportunity, you give it your best shot. And you don't know what will happen. You know, you might fly, it might sink, who knows, you know. So what are you current so what are you currently focused on and the kind of future that you're looking towards? I mean locked up at home, um, I wrote a script. <laughs> I mean that's only me and the computer, you know, so, so I, I did that and yeah, I mean, I've applied for some grants and all that uh, locally and internationally. So hopefully something will happen. Yeah, and we but, talked about this a little off air before we started recording, which is the the question where I asked where you whether you try to work outside of Malaysia. I wonder if you could share a little uh, bit about the realities of working here in your industry. Yeah, I've always wanted to have a international if not regional career you know I mean uh, just to see what it's like I mean just as a, the next challenge because in terms of Malaysia it's kind of like done a lot of the things that I wanted to do so I mean I want to see what's out there how do people do it differently how, how do they do it bigger how do they do it better and I need to learn as well I've made some headway to some degree I mean China in particular but uh, it never it never really panned out for me. I'm still trying. It's not that I've given up, you know. So I don't know whether it might be better in the future. You know? yeah. What do you think is the biggest issue, if you will? Biggest issue is for me personally is that I'm not big enough. I mean, I'm not known internationally, and neither am I known uh, regionally. But how do you make yourself known? Like, you need the chance, right? Correct. You need that one break. You need that one break. Same as Puchu Gunung Medang. I need that one break. And I haven't got that one break yet. So, I mean, I don't know. I will keep knocking on the door. Let's see what happens, you know? Yeah, Has there been any, have there been any people in your industry that you feel have done well and managed to break those walls that you would like to, like, be aspire towards? There are. There's, there's, a, um, there's a director from Penang who's, in, uh, who's living in China who's made a great Chinese film, uh, which is a huge hit as well. But I mean, I'm not, I'm sure he paid his views. He went through the process, hung around, did his thing. There are some in Taiwan as well. I mean, as you know, there are some like um, in LA, 
some relation to our making it big in the music side, in the directing side, in the acting side as well, you know? Yeah. Do you feel it's so, important to move to those locations? Like, because I was interviewing some musicians and they said, I would have never made it this big if I stayed in Malaysia. There, there's some truth in it. There's some truth in it, but it depends on where, you, where you're at. So, I mean, if I were 30 years younger or even 20 years younger, I would do that move. But I mean, at, at where I am right now, I'm, I guess I kind of like hanker for a comfort zone. You know, you, you don't want to displace yourself completely and then sleep on sofas, couch go couch surfing at my age. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's different. Um, <laughs> I, would, I would like the terms to be a little bit more encouraging, you know? Yeah, I don't know whether it will happen or not. But yeah, I'm... Not that I'm sport, but the thing is that as important as it is, I'm not going to uproot myself completely and put myself through the grinder and crawl on broken glass to get it. Not anymore, you know. So maybe make, that makes me less competitive, I don't know, but you know, but this is the frame I'm in at the moment. You know? Yeah. And for those who are just beginning to enter the industry, like what would your advice be for them? Like, pay your dues in Malaysia, try and get to LA. What would your advice be? Anywhere you are, actually, the key is determination. Determination. I mean, honestly, I've been in the industry for over 30 years. And I've seen much better than people that not make it. You know, so... You, you know, you have to really stay focused and you have to really want it. That's why I said maybe my not wanting it so badly to be international might work against me. It could possibly be. But even locally, you have to give up a lot you know, to, to, to stick to it. You know, you can see it. I mean, I remember in my days when I, even as successful as I was doing TV commercials and all that, you can see your other friends doing so well and having cars and having houses and, and, and everything. Two-week I mean, holidays. Not that, the, <laughs> not that they are the most important thing to me, but I mean, that's the measure. So you got to go out there and be kind of like the artistic black sheep. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, he's the one in the art. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> kind of backhanded, you know, like, I mean, you know, yeah. but you take it. You, you take it because that's what you choose. That's what I chose. You know? So I'm not going to... I see it's out there. I'm not going to complain about it. But yeah. So all this time, you have never felt your love for the industry like diminish in any way or become jaded? Myself? Yeah. It's a constant struggle not to be jaded. It's mm. so easy to fall back on bitterness and, and blame everybody else for your own problems, you know, for everything circumstances for your situation but a lot of things is, is you as well you know you got to take responsibility for it you know? yeah. but it's sliding doors right whether you choose to do this or not that to return the call one day earlier or one day later you know it changes things you know so and looking back what do you think was the best investment that you've made I think the best investment anyone can make is to look after themselves. To stay as healthy as they can physically and mentally. You know, and also the one thing that I'm very fortunate with or for is that I am very diverse interest. Yeah, so it keeps me I'm a generalist. I find a lot of things interesting and fascinating and um, I'm actually a master at none, you know, but but it feeds my soul. The different things feed my soul at different points. And you'll find that as one diminishes, as, as one is like suffering, the other one is enriching you, you know, the sort of So there's always a balance. And also, I have a lot of friends outside the industry. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's the, it's the same thing, you know. So it keeps me from, from being too... All eggs in one basket, I guess. But I was just made this way. I mean, it's, I, to be fair, it's not something I decided I'm going to be like that. You know, I just so happen that I am like that, and I just recognize that about myself. You know. Yeah. 
And is there like an important truth that you believe in, but many people don't? Honesty has always been my policy from even when I was young. You know? So I believe that's the best way to go. I mean, come what may, nobody, everybody will always appreciate it. Even though initially they might not, you know, but in, in, because I don't think anybody likes to be fooled. I mean, myself, the, it's a very the simple principle of treat everyone the way you would like them to treat you. You know, the, the way you like to be treated. So, you know, if you don't, if I don't like to be disrespected, I don't disrespect other people. And, you know, I like people to be honest with me, so I'm honest with people. It's just very basic, I like guess. I'm not, I'm so deep. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. like, the, there is so much that's written about you online. You've also put yourself out there with your own like play and also film. Is can you tell us like one thing people probably don't know about you from the media? I'm actually shy. Oh. A lot of people laugh when I say that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's actually not natural to me. It's not natural to me, but I I, re I recognize that I need to be to put myself out there, so I so I do, you know, yeah. But I'm quite happy being at home. I'm quite happy, you know. And some sometimes I don't talk to people. It's not because I don't recognize them, but I feel I don't know them well enough. No, I mean they might have met them once or twice socially, but. You don't know well enough to go up and impose yourself on people. Mm -hmm. so, but then, I mean, it's still true that I'm actually basically shy. Mm -hmm. And what can people do after listening to this interview to help make your life better, support you? Make their own lives better? Make your life better. Oh, I don't know. I never thought <laughs> Watch my film. I guess. <laughs> I, What's the best way um, to find your films though? Because like, like your own film or something. No, actually, to be honest, I couldn't find it. I, I don't own my film. You know, I I mean, mm. there's two like you mean the world to me and hooray hooray. I co-produce with Astro Shaw. I uh, one with Diamond Ungu, one with Astro Shaw. Um, but by contract, they handle the marketing of it. All the sales and marketing handled by Astro. So uh, my part was to do the production and all that. So yeah, sometimes management changes and all that. You, you don't really know what your plans are. But um, like Putri Gunung Leda is owned by Kiara's company, Infinity, you know, and, and some other things are owned outright by the others. So I don't really know, uh, have any control, I guess, over this thing. You know? Yeah, well, tell me, thank you so much for spending so much time with me. I, yeah. normally, I normally end with these questions. So the first one is, do you feel that you have found your why? I found what? Found My your why. why. It keeps shifting. It seems to be shifting. You know what I mean? Because what I find is that your priorities change. You know? So um, I don't know. I, every time I think I found my why, uh, something happens and then you, you realize that maybe you haven't found it. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, so um, I don't have an easy answer to that. Yeah. And what kind of legacy do you want to leave behind? Hmm. What's written on the tombstone sort of thing, right? Yeah. I think... that I tried my best every time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what do you think are the most important qualities a person should have to succeed as you have in your field? I think sincerity. Sincerity, I mean, I mean, determination is a given. I mean, and also I guess whatever you choose, the talent is a given, you know? But um, sincerity, determination will get you further than even talent, you know, to be honest. Like I said, I've seen so many other better people in my industry and who have not had the opportunities I did. They are better, but I'm luckier, I guess. You know what I mean? Like, um, so don't, 
don't don't let it get to you. I mean, success or failure, you know, it's all temporary. You just enjoy the moment, stay in the moment, and do the best you can every time. That's it. The work itself is a is a reward. You know, being able to do the work is a reward. And if anything else is a bonus. Anything more than that is a bonus. And where can people go to connect with you and find out what you're doing and support you? Okay, I think the easiest is Facebook. I'm I'm actually on Instagram as well, but I'm not really active because. I'm of the generation that one social media outlet is there now. At least you <laughs> have <I> Instagram. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not bad, folks. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but Facebook is the most easiest to get me, get hold of me, and to see what I'm up to. And I, I post all sorts of nonsense, you know. I mean, pictures of birds and pictures of funny things. You know? <laughs> but you also share interesting articles as well, like on, you know, like the role of a product producer. Yeah, I've got two things. I've got two Facebook uh, things. Uh, one is more to do with general interest and one is more to do with uh, industry. So how do they yeah. find you? What what name do they look for? I think both are the same name. Uh, how does that work? I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. I, just for Tiong Hin, just- yeah. Put your name in Sot Yong Hing. Maybe I should put the, the, the other one a different name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I will put all the links in the show notes so people can find it. They just have to all go right. to that link. Cool. And is there anything else that you would like to share or talk about that we haven't covered yet? I have this favorite phrase I use, uh, surrender to the universe. No, no, I mean, honestly, the universe wants, wants what's best for you. Sometimes you're your own worst enemy, your own worst block to what's best for you. you know? So just go with the flow. And something that happens to you that might feel like a disaster might actually be a, be a silver lining. You know, might actually work out to be better. You know, as I've learned first time. Amazing. It's not easy, but yeah. try well- it. Tiongheng, thank you so much for your time and participating in this. Thank you, Lingya. Good chat.